Welcome to this QuestMed SBA tutorial. My name is Yezen, and today we will be reviewing single best answers in hematology. It's sometimes quite difficult to get exposure to hematology on medical wards, but quite often these questions do come up in exams. During this tutorial, we will review key topics you will be expected to know for your exams, as well as practical aspects for you to make use of when you become a doctor. We hope you find this tutorial useful and what we're going to do today is we'll be running through single best answer questions asking you to pause read the question and we will be going through the answer by reviewing each individual choice and then going into more detail about the concept underlying the question we will be discussing the key topics that you'll be expected to know ranging from anemias bleeding disorders key blood disorders and also some practicalities about how to approach certain scenarios in hematology. This is the first question. Please pause the screen and have a read. The answer here is sideroblastic anemia. So this is a question where you have a 32 year old man who's receiving therapy for tuberculosis. So that's the first clue. And you can see that he has a microcytic anemia with an increased ferritin, transferrin saturation and serum iron. So the, f the second thing you need to think about here is that you have someone with a microcytic anemia. The most common uh, cause of a microcytic anemia is an iron deficiency anemia. But here you can see that there is an increased ferritin, which doesn't really fit with an iron deficiency anemia. So that will tell you that it should be something else. Um, there's another clue. The film shows basophilic granules. Now, if you're lucky enough to have come across this before, you'll know that basophilic granules are associated with sideroblastic anemia. That's why the answer here is correct. The other aspect to take into consideration here is that you have someone who is um, who has previously had tuberculosis and they are likely to have been treated with a, a medication uh, for tuberculosis such as isoniazid, which is a well-known cause of sideroblastic anemia. If we look at the other, other answers, you'll find that anemia of chronic disease is, can be associated with a microcytic anemia, but is most commonly associated with a normocytic anemia. That makes it less likely as well. Vitamin B12 is more associated with a macrocytic anemia, as is hypothyroidism. So that's why sideroblastic anemia is the correct answer here. So talking about anemia, you can see on this left-hand side that the symptoms of anemia are quite vague. So fatigue, shortness of breath, faintness, palpitations. And that's one of the reasons why we do a full blood count on anyone with any symptoms who comes into hospital, just to see whether or not they do have any evidence of anemia. And on the right hand side, you can see some more rarer things that you might expect. So conjunctival pal pallor, which we examined for uh, throughout our clinical examinations. And then also rarely you can have heart failure secondary to anemia. So that might be something you might consider treating if someone's got heart failure as well. But also the concern is you may also overload them if you give them uh, too much in terms of a blood transfusion. So you may want to cautiously give them a blood transfusion alongside some frusamide to offload them as well. So microcytic anemia, as we said earlier, iron deficiency is the most common cause. Um, again, we said that anemia of chronic disease can be microcytic, but normocytic anemia, again, uh, most commonly so in anemia of chronic disease. Thalassemia is uh, associated with it as well. And finally, sideroblastic anemia. And the cause of sideroblastic anemia is often ineffective red blood cell production. And that can be congenital or it can be acquired. And in the context we saw earlier, secondary to medications or other disorders. And if you see this image on the right-hand side, you can see the speckled appearance of some of the blood cells, um, particularly in the center. And you can see that, that is basophilic stippling, which is pathognomonic in your exam for sideroblastic anemia. Iron deficiency anemia is very important to be aware about how to manage someone with iron deficiency anemia. The reason for that is because iron deficiency anemia is not a diagnosis in itself. It is a cause, uh, it is usually caused by something else. So we can see here that it can be related to something like malabsorption, such as in celiac disease, but also if someone has blood loss. In a young woman, we would ask about menorrhagia, as a cause of iron deficiency anemia, but also in an elderly male, we would consider something like a gastrointestinal cancer, for example, and therefore we would consider an urgent endoscopy or a colonoscopy. In the developing world, hookworm is also a cause of iron deficiency anemia, but we see it extremely rarely in the United Kingdom. Um, the other important aspect in this slide is to 
uh, direct you towards eating dirt, which is an obscure fact if you're a fan of obscure facts. Uh, Pika syndrome is a cause of iron deficiency when children eat dirt or clay, and it is uh, a cause of iron deficiency anemia as well, just to be aware of. Uh, finally, if we just look at the bottom, you can see here that uh, colonicia, angular stone, stomatitis, and glossitis are uh, features of iron deficiency anemia, and you can see them on clinical examination, but the, again, they're not very common. We should investigate it very clearly, iron deficiency anemia, and uh, as we said uh, earlier, it is not a diagnosis, and should be investigated thoroughly. So that's the, one of the take-home points from this lecture that you always need to investigate further. If you do want to manage, you'll need to replace the iron stores. So you may treat someone with oral, oral iron for at least three months and try and restore the hemoglobin um, back to normal. One key issue about iron tablets is that it can cause a lot of GI disturbance, so patients sometimes don't take it, but also it can lead to black stools. This is challenging because sometimes you have patients who come in with a presumed upper GI bleed, they have black stools, so then you're thinking, is this melina or is this iron deficiency anemia treated with uh, oral iron supplements? So it's a tricky one. So when you're taking a history, you always need to ask, are you on iron tablets? That will help you to direct your management going forward as well. This is the second question, so pause the screen and have a read. The answer here is subacute combined degeneration of the cord. So this 27-year-old vegan woman, that's your first clue, um, so anyone who's vegan in an exam scenario, you may expect them to have some sort of deficiency of some sort. So uh, you've, you've got someone who's got a gradual neurological disturbance, sensory dysfunction, knee jerks are present and planters are upgoing, so that would indicate an upper motor neuron lesion, and Romberg's test is positive. So Romberg's test is a test you would do as part of your neurological examination where you ask the patient to stand up and then close their eyes. And you, the key thing you're looking at is whether or not they start to sway when they've closed their eyes. If they only sway when they close their eyes, that means they have a sensory neuropathy. That makes the test positive. If they sway when they are both open, have their eyes open or closed, that's more likely to be another cause, such as cerebellar dysfunction, for example. So looking at the other cause, other differentials here, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, you, that is not the correct answer here. The reason for that is that is motor neuron disease. So you would not expect any sensory dysfunction to be associated with this disorder. Ischemic stroke, again, a younger woman, less likely to have an ischemic stroke. And also, it is much less common for a stroke to have a mixed motor and sensory loss. On the most part, you would expect either motor or sensory. Uh, of course, there are exceptions, but it's less likely. Multiple sclerosis is um, certainly fits the epidemiology here, but again, you would not expect much of a gradual weakness. You'd expect flares that would suddenly come on in hours or days rather than a gradual two-month weakness. And again, vitamin E deficiency, although it can be associated with, with certain uh, disorders, quite a wide variety of disorders, I guess the key aspect here to know is that it is something you probably won't have heard about, and it's a distractor here. So a good rule of thumb for single best answer questions is if you haven't heard about it, it's probably not the right answer. So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, so subacute combined degeneration of the cord is related to B12 deficiency. So that fits with the, the uh, 27 year old vegan woman. Uh, the other aspect here is that you can have sensory neuropathy secondary to B12 deficiency, but you can also affect the corticospinal tract, which leads to upper motor neuron signs. And that's why this answer is correct. So what I wanted to talk about in the context of B12 deficiency is macrocytic anemia. So there are two ways of differentiating between different types of macrocytic anemia. You can have megaloblastic and macrocytic anemia or non-megaloblastic. So megaloblasts in uh, are large immature red blood cells. You can see them on the blood film and also they have hypersegmented neutrophils. And they are caused by inhibition of DNA synthesis, and you need folate and B12 to allow that to occur, and you don't have that, so therefore you can get these megaloblasts instead. So the number, the number, there are a number of conditions. So you have B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, and also methotrexate can cause a megaloblastic anemia. Uh, 
and other aspects that you would, um, other key things that do cause macrocytosis are alcohol and hypothyroidism. So if anyone comes in on the acute medical take and you see that they have uh, a macrocytic anemia, it's very important to take a very detailed alcohol history so that you are happy with um, the fact that they either do drink alcohol that explains the macrocytic anemia, or there's an unexplained macrocytic anemia that you may need to investigate further. Perhaps they may have a myelodysplastic syndrome that they didn't know about. So that's something to take into consideration. And that links your history taking with your examination and also your further investigations going forward. This is the third question. So pause the screen and have a read of the question. The answer here is venous thromboembolism. So let's look at the question in itself. So you have a 60 year old man, he has an elective surgery, HB hemoglobin is 19, platelet counts not too raised, slightly raised, asymptomatic, but there is some mild splenomegaly and he has a red complexion. So you've got raised red cell mass and erythropoietin level is normal. So here you're thinking, okay, the, I, I suppose the most striking thing here is that he's got a very raised hemoglobin and the splenomegaly. So in that case, you'd be thinking, hmm, is this some sort of uh, leukemia or lymphoma or some malignant disorder? And probably based on that, you'd probably be right in thinking, oh, is this something suspicious I need to look into? So looking at the... Um, looking at the raised red cell mass that's the key so this you may have come across this disorder so this is polycythemia rubra vera which is when you have a malignant proliferation of red cells and that can lead to a number of complications so as we'll find out later polycythemia can be primary and secondary we'll talk about that in a bit more detail later but let's look at the choices at hand first so hypercalcemia is not associated often with polycythemia rubra vera. That's more associated with myeloma and um, the intracerebral hemorrhage. So I guess one key aspect here is that you have a lot of red cells in your blood. So you might expect them to clump together and cause lots of occlusion. And that's why intracerebral hemorrhage is less likely. It's more likely to be a clot like a stroke, for example. And that's basically why the answer E is correct, venous thromboembolism. So when you have polycythemia rubra vera, you're at higher risk of thromboembolism, venous thromboembolism, and also arterial as well. And you may want to treat for that as well. We'll talk about it in a sec. Hypouricemia is incorrect. So this is mainly pointing towards how in some patients who are treated for their malignant disorders or their blood disorders, they can get hyperuricemia, secondary to tumor lysis syndrome. So in this case, you wouldn't expect them to have hypouricemia. And finally, core pulmonale. So this is looking at how you can get evidence of polycythemia. So you can get primary polycythemia, which can be related to a genetic disorder, for example, putting you at higher risk, or you can get secondary polycythemia. And that is mainly when you have a chronic uh, hypoxia, where such as in COPD, for example, which can lead to right-sided heart failure. And subsequently, you can get um, a reactive polycythemia as you're trying to get more oxygen into the blood. So in this case, the fact he doesn't have any past medical history that would point towards that makes it less likely to be uh, core pulmonale. So uh, venous thromboembolism is the answer because it is a very uh, well-recognized complication of raised red cell mass, subsequent clumping in the blood cells, in the, in the blood vessels, and therefore you can get occlusion in many different areas. So what we're talking about earlier about primary and secondary polycythemia, um, I think the most important thing to, to remember when you're looking at exam questions at the very least is that you can get polycythemia associated with the JAK2 mutation. So keep that in mind if anyone ever asks you what the underlying genetic abnormality is. And just at the bottom, you can see that you can get secondary polycythemia, secondary to chronic hypoxia. And again, something like COPD, for example, can certainly be a, a cause of that. And you can see patients who have red faces as well, uh, which so it, it can certainly be that if they have the past medical history. So to treat, uh, you would uh, offer venous section to so taking blood out. Hydroxyurea can suppress the uh, production of these red blood cells. And aspirin can reduce the complications of polycythemia via reducing platelet aggregation and subsequently can lead to less 
the reduced likelihood of uh, occlusion of the blood vessels. So this is question four. So pause the screen, please, and have a read. So uh, this is um, a 36-year-old who has had shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain. She's got pulmonary embolism, um, and she also has a history of antiphospholipid syndrome, deep vein thrombosis, and she's had warfarin. So this is a common enough question for you to be aware of. It can be a bit tricky sometimes, but if you stick to the underlying principles, you should be all right. So you'll know that if someone has a pulmonary embolism, you may consider giving them a direct oral anticoagulant, or you might start them on warfarin, depending on the patient. So in this scenario, she's on warfarin. So you'd expect them initially, in most people who start warfarin, to have an INR of 2 to 3. And that's for, for pulmonary embolism, rather than an aortic valve, a metallic aortic valve, for example, might be a target INR of 3 to 4. But if you have someone who has had a target INR of 2 to 3, and they still have a pulmonary embolism, you would expect them to expect that as treatment failure. Therefore, you would want to increase the target INR and therefore reduce the risk of further events. And essentially, that's why the answer B is correct, because you have a, a higher target INR. And also, you have someone here who has a history of antiphospholipid syndrome, which makes a much higher risk of uh, thromboembolism going forward. So warfarin for life, again, is the right answer here. So... That is the, uh, these are the, the rules of thumb, as it were. So it would really uh, depend on the etiology of the pulmonary embolism. Um, the other distinction is between when you should treat for three months or when you should treat for six months. So that does come up quite often as well. So if it's a provoked PE, for example, secondary to a surgery, um, you could treat for three months. But if it's unprovoked, you should treat for six months. And if there's an underlying cause, the likelihood is you probably will treat them for life. And if someone has a recurrent venous thromboembolism, you would want to increase the INR to 3 to 4 as well. So this is the fifth question. Uh, please have a read and pause the screen. The answer here is autoimmune intravascular hemolysis. So you have someone who has a mycoplasma pneumonia, and he uh, describes uh, red-brown urine discoloration, and he has jaundice, he's icteric and his HB is 98, with the normal white cells, normal platelets, and also raised LDH. Um, so I guess the, the, the thing that, this is obviously very abnormal for a 28-year-old, I think one really good way of thinking about anemias, which this, this patient definitely has, is that the LDH is quite raised. And generally, if you look at someone who has a raised LDH, which is lactate dehydrogenase, that essentially means that they have an hemolytic anemia. So that's a good way of very quickly finding, figuring out what's going on. So if you look at the, the choices, you have acute blood loss, Again, that's less likely in a 28-year-old, and it doesn't really fit the stem. You wouldn't really expect someone to be uh, to have jaundice secondary to that. So really, you're thinking about hemolysis. So it's probably going to be B, C, or D. And the reason it could be hemolysis is because you have jaundice, you have a high bilirubin, which is probably because you have lots of blood cells being broken down. Um, the reason it's less likely to be E is because with bone marrow suppression, you'd expect most other things to be low as well. So the HB might be low, the white cells would be low, and the platelets would be low. So that's less likely. So the um, other aspects, really, the, the, the key differentiation is going to be, this is, is between the immune and the autoimmune and the non-immune intravascular hemolysis. So again, this is happening within the blood uh, within the blood vessels, so it's more likely to be intravascular rather than an extravascular hemolysis. And the, you may instantly know the answer to this in the sense that if you know that mycoplasma pneumonia is a very common cause of cold autoimmune hemolysis, you will know that the answer is D. Um, but you can also try and figure it out yourself in the sense that to, to remind yourself what the non-immune causes. So really, the non-immune causes of intravascular hemolysis can be related to certain um, certain disorders, such as uh, having metallic heart valves, for example, or also can be secondary to infection as well. But really, it's, it is the lots of infections can lead to autoimmune disorders coming up, and mycoplasma is certainly one of them, making this the correct answer.
So if we were to look at the distinction again between um, the different types of hemolytic anemia, you can have hereditary and acquired. So on this left-hand side, you'll see lots of um, disorders that you might have come across in the past. So spherocytosis, leptocytosis, G6PD, pyruvate kinase deficiency, and sickle cell disease, all hereditary causes of hemolytic anemia. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, autoimmune causes, uh, red cell fragmentation, as we were talking about, that can be related to things like sepsis, for example, or if you have a metallic heart valve. March hemoglobinuria is something that was described in the 1800s when you had sold soldiers that were marching for prolonged periods of time and it subsequently led to a breakdown of blood vessels and sometimes and they would get hemoglobinuria. Infections such as malaria, again, common cause of uh, hemolysis. And uh, just at the bottom there, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, again, an acquired cause that can lead to um, blood loss or rather sorry a red uh, urine at night secondary to ongoing hemolysis you don't need to know about it that much but it's just important to know that it is an acquired rather than a hereditary cause with regards to autoimmune causes it can be further broken down into warm and cold and essentially it's where the antibodies will bind so in warm hemolytic anemia you would want to you would consider that they are binding at the body temperature, so they're centrally hemolytic, whereas with cold hemolytic anemia, it's more in the peripheries. So that's why when you have someone with a mycoplasma pneumonia, they may have very cold peripheries because that is where the binding is occurring. And again, there are different antibodies, so IgM in cold and IgG in warm. And the, the most important things, especially that do come up in exams um, in terms of the causes of warm hemolytic anemia is lymphoma and systemic lupus erythematosus. Whereas in cold, mycoplasma, EP, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus are the, certainly the most common. And the treatments, you don't need to know too much about the treatments, but uh, it's, it's good to know that you may consider steroids in the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias as well. So this is question six. Please pause. So this is a 75-year-old asymptomatic man. He has a heart valve, metallic aortic valve, and he has a normal cystic anemia with a high LDH. So based on what we were talking about earlier, high LDH essentially means that they have a hemolytic anemia on the most part um, for your exams. So that makes it quite simple in that sense in that you have a hemolytic anemia as a cause. So you have shearing forces where the blood pushes against um, the heart valves, they break down, and you can see um, broken down products as well on the blood film. Uh, so whereas, or you can see immature uh, blood products as well, uh, immature red blood cells as well on the blood film, which in this case is reticulocytes. So the other stuff, the other uh, choices here, so iron deficiency, less likely in a normal cystic anemia. He's not really on any drugs that we can see that would cause a drug-induced anemia. Acute blood loss can cause a normal cystic anemia, but wouldn't necessarily cause the high LDH and a chronic myeloid leukemia. You would probably expect a high white cell count rather than normal white cell count. So you can come to the conclusion here uh, in different ways. Uh, but uh, again, I think the key here is you, you're thinking about high LDH, a normal cystic anemia, and also um, the fact that there's a normal white cell count, that will push you more towards a hemolytic anemia as well. Uh, so one way of distinguishing between immune and non-immune hemolytic anemia is by doing a direct Coombs test. So it essentially um, allows you to have blood samples from patients, and then you add the anti-human antibodies. And what you're looking at really is whether or not the antibodies bind together. And that allows you to indicate whether or not this is an, there's an immune cause for the hemolysis. The indirect Coombs test is mainly looking at a patient's serum and is mainly used for uh, pregnant women uh, to see whether or not they have certain antibodies against, uh, which could be a, um, against the fetus. So it's less used um, on, on medical wards on the most part. So the direct Coombs test is, is the most uh, useful in our scenarios here for hemolytic anemia.
The next question is asking you about patients with high INR. And uh, I've, I've not put a single best answer question here because I wanted to explain it in a bit more detail because um, it, it can get a bit tricky sometimes. Because again, there are underlying principles that you should take into consideration. So you will may have seen uh, lots of different um, pieces of information about this, but there are a few distinctions with regards to how we look at the complications of having a high INR. So some uh, people might have major bleeds and some might have minor bleeds. So the image here, you can see that white spot on the right-hand side of the brain, that is an intracerebral hemorrhage. We would consider that to be a major bleed, whereas a minor bleed might be a small amount of bleeding, such as epistaxis, for example, and that allows us to distinguish, uh, that allows us to guide our management options. Obviously, in some individuals, you can have you can have uh, PR bleeding, for example, which might be quite a small amount of PR bleeding, or it might be an excessive amount, which can lead to an acute cardiorespiratory uh, hemodynamic instability, as it were. So uh, there can be a bit of a gray area. So you need to use your clinical judgment sometimes to distinguish between a major or a minor bleed. So then you can see this uh, lovely uh, a diagram of sorts that will you you may have seen this a few times about when to stop warfarin and when to increase a warfarin or when to restart warfarin and and really the key here is that you have someone who has a very raised INR not only do you need to think about the acute scenario and what you're treating but also the idea is that if you're going to give someone treatment such as with the vitamin K in order to uh, reduce the INR, it will lead to a relatively long term, maybe over a, a week or two of dysfunction in the INR. So it'll make it much more difficult to control later on. So the principle is you only really need to give vitamin K if it is extremely, extremely raised um, and um, there is a likelihood of uh, a bleed or there is a major bleed. So as you can see here, only really when you're getting to an INR of more than eight. Uh, risk factors, um, or there is, then you would give the oral vitamin K. And then if there's major bleeding, then you would obviously stop the warfarin. You might give, or you definitely would give in that case, if you have an upper, uh, upper GI bleed that is extremely um, extremely severe, or if you have an intracerebral hemorrhage, you would give prothrombin concentrate, and you'd also give vitamin K as well. So that, those are the principles that should guide you when you have a patient with a high INR as well. And then the other aspect is you need to think, why do they have a high INR? Is it that they have taken too much of their warfarin, for example? Are they taking any medication that is causing them to have a high INR? Um, so anything like an inhibitor, for example, of the INR. So you need to take a very good history uh, as well once you have stabilized the patient. So this is question eight. So uh, please pause the screen. So the answer here is our odds. So you've got a 30-year-old female. She has fatigue, weight loss, menorrhagia, easy bruising, and a very low hemoglobin, very raised white cell count of 30, and low platelets. She's got a prolonged prothrombin time, an activated partial thrombolastin time, low fibrinogen, and a raised D-dimer. So you really looking at this, you think, is this, does this patient have some sort of leukemia or something like that? And the reason for that is there's an extremely raised white cell count. But then if you look in more detail here, you're thinking, okay, what else is going on? It's a very low hemoglobin, very low platelets, um, and then and there's some bleeding disorder. So this is a very specific thing that you need to think about when you have someone with a, a, a leukemia in the sense that is there any, are there any complications and do I need to treat it? So essentially the the key clues here is uh, um the key clue here is actually that you have a low fibrinogen and also the raised d dimer so that's really indicating to you that there's a bleeding disorder and there is a something is being used up and in context of people who are usually very unwell that is tech that is often um what is known as disseminated intravascular coagulation so that is the first thing to take into consideration so you've got this Someone, someone with probable leukemia, they've got a clotting disorder, could be DIC, and what other things or what f blood film findings could be consistent with that. So if you look at it, um, the 
Uh, you have smudge cells, so that is more associated with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Again, leukemic lymphoblastic cells, you could get that in certain um, lymphoblastic leukemias, mature myeloid cells as well. Again, these are not the things that you're technically expected to know about relations to, in relation to leukemias, but the key one really is our odds. And our odds is very sort of pathognomonic of acute promyelocytic leukemia, AML, and it is when you have an AML with DIC, that is likely to be this very aggressive form of AML, basically. And then finally, rouleau formation is when you have the red blood cells clumping together. And again, it's not really associated with this, but it's more associated with things like myeloma, for example. So it's less likely to be the answer here. So again, your um, acute my myeloid leukemia, or in, in the you can have the, um, as you can see on that right-hand side, you can see our rods. So do you see those very small lines uh, that look at that, um, especially with the arrow on that left hand side, uh, you can see uh, our rods. And that is basically when you have someone with AML and a disseminated intravascular coagulation, they uh, that is almost always associated with acute promyelocytic leukemia. And our rods would be found on the blood film. And they could have things like splenomegaly and gum hypertrophy um, as well. So that is uh, acute myeloid leukemia in a nutshell, just so you know the key exam questions that you expected to know. In terms of management, um, you would have a lot of, sometimes a lot of issues alongside your um, yeah, the disorder that's in front of you. So you can have anemias, thrombocytopenias, DIC as well, and also this concept of tumor lysis syndrome, where you have a uh, electrolyte abnormalities, which can be secondary to excessive cell breakdown, which we referred to earlier when you have a very high urate as well. So the treatment for that is going to be having um, essentially supportive management. So you may transfuse and give platelets, uh, you may give allopurinol, uh, for the tumor lysis syndrome, and also you would want to give um, prophylaxis for the for the um, central nervous system through certain chemotherapies, which I won't go into at this time. But basically, a lot of the issues, especially you as a junior doctor when you start working, are going to be around the supportive management of uh, AML rather than the nitty gritty about what type of chemotherapy you use. So it's important to always be aware of these complications that can uh, crop up quite commonly. So this is question nine. Please pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is E. So this is a patient who has a family history of von Willebrand's disease, and they have persistent nosebleeds and severe bruising. So here you're thinking, oh, do they have von Willebrand's disease themselves? So you're expected to look at the pattern of clotting tests and trying to figure out what the cause is. So von Willebrand's disease, uh, as you might know, is related to having a um, abnormality in the von Willebrand's factor itself, and that prevents you from aggregating your platelets accordingly. And therefore, you don't actually have a platelet problem, so you have normal platelets, um, so that rules out D. And then also it can lead to a prolonged bleeding time because you're not really able to aggregate properly your platelets. So therefore, uh, you have, um, so that would give you E and B, uh, so it has to be prolonged. And then the last thing to be aware of with von Willebrand's disease that is also associated with the dysfunction of factor eight as well. And that will lead you to have a prolonged APTT rather than a normal uh, PT. So that is why E is correct. So let's go through that in a bit more detail. So von Willebrand's disease is a very common inherited bleeding disorder. So you can have reduced quantity or function of the von Willebrand factor, and you have this decreased factor eight activity. So really you have a normal prothrombin time, which um, is essentially equivalent to the INR, uh, but the APTT is prolonged and the bleeding time as well is. So, and you don't really have bleeding into the joints or muscles as well. So that's, it's a very common inherited bleeding disorder. And the, it does come up in questions sometimes when you have someone who has just a bleeding disorder of some sort, and then the question says, what is the most common? What is the most likely disorder? And it's probably going to be von Willebrand's disease as well. So that's uh, another way that uh, it's useful to know the epidemiology of certain diseases in, compar in comparison to others as well. So this is question 10. Have a read. 
So you have a 64 year old, uh, he's a bit short of breath, hemoglobin is quite low, we're transfusing, and then he has a low grade fever, 37.7 degrees. He appears well though. So this is how, this is just a, a question to show you how to deal with patients who have uh, complications after blood transfusion and how to, to deal with them. So uh, you have different options here, but really the point here is that you have someone who just has a bit of a fever, actually well, the likelihood is it's probably absolutely fine to just slow it down, give some paracetamol, um, but also to be aware of monitoring for any other complications as well. So that's why the other options are not correct. And uh, also you wouldn't want to continue the transfusion. You would want to just to try and ease them into the transfusion a bit better as well by giving them the paracetamol. Um, and, and slowing it down. But it's very important to be aware of all the acute blood transfusion reactions. So the most important, um, which in the sense that you'll be called to see early on, is going to be anaphylaxis, and because that will, might lead to an airway uh, disorder, which uh, may need some, you may need some help with that. Uh, so calling uh, the anesthetist to come and help you out with that. And there, in that case, you would stop the transfusion, You'd give adrenaline, chlorphenamine, hydrocortisone, as you would with any anaphylactic patient. And then you may also get a hemolytic transfusion reaction. And that is very rare nowadays um, because of the measures put in place uh, to make sure that everyone gets the right blood at the right time. And you have an incompatible blood bag given to the patient and they tend to have a fever and they become very agitated and really hypotension does feature quite a lot. So having a normal set of observations is quite reassuring. Can develop to disseminated intravascular coagulation. So you stop the transfusion, give saline, treat the DIC as you would. Um, febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions. This is what we were talking about earlier. You slow it down, you give paracetamol, you monitor for any changes. And finally, transfusion-associated circulatory overload. Essentially, what happens here is that you have someone who has, for example, a known history of heart failure. You're giving them blood, which is fluid, and then they go into acute heart failure. So in that sense, the best way of dealing with that early on is to make sure to slow down the transfusion over a longer period of time, for example, over four hours or even longer, um, and then to give them frusamide as well if they become a bit breathless or they have obvious clinical signs of congestive cardiac failure. And that is very common uh, on medical wards, so you need to be aware of that. So question 11. So pause the screen and have a read. So again, we're trying now to go through a very... Uh, important disorders, and we will be going through similar things um, as you start to realize there are patterns to what we're talking about. So we were we were looking at this patient who has fever, headache, and vomiting, a five-year-old, pyrexial, neck stiffness, petechial skin rash, obviously very, very unwell, probably secondary to a meningitis, and then they become even more unwell. They are bleeding everywhere. So really you're thinking here about disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is essentially um, where, as we were talking about earlier, you have a decreased fibrinogen, decreased platelets, and an elevated D-dimer. And the way to think about it is that with DIC, you've just got lots and lots of clotting. So you're clotting everywhere and you're using up all your fibrinogen, you're using up all your platelets because you're clotting, you are releasing more D-dimer, which is a breakdown product of all the clots you're forming. And because you're using everything up there, your normal function doesn't go ahead and therefore you bleed everywhere. So it's a bit um, of a paradox, I suppose, in the sense that you're, you're clotting a lot, but actually you're bleeding. But if you think about it logically and you link it to the blood test, it does make more sense. That's why C is correct and the others are incorrect. So... What you really need to consider um, in, in DIC is that you need to be aware of it in any patient who is very, very unwell. So anyone with trauma, burns, sepsis, obstetric complications, those are the sort of patients you need to monitor very, very closely. Uh, look for any signs of any bleeding anywhere as well. And then you hopefully will be able to act on things early, escalate as required, and make sure that they are monitored appropriately going forward. So this is question 12, so pause the screen and have a read. So we have a 75-year-old with back pain and fatigue, 
and they have an IgG paraprotein spike and urinary Benz-Jones protein is detected. So you'll remember that urinary Benz-Jones protein, if that's detected, that's most likely associated with a diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So really the, the question is trying to look at what certain complications are for myeloma and that's why hypercalcemia is the correct answer because it's most associated with uh, myeloma. So if you look at the other stuff, so you can get thrombocytosis, more likely thrombocytopenia. Um, osteoporosis at the end here is not so associated with myeloma. You do get this sort of bone disorder, lytic bone disease, but it's not osteoporosis. And then hypocalcemia as well. You would not expect that's so hypercalcemia and equally with hypophosphatemia, uh, you would expect um, the, the main electrolyte abnormality is hypercalcemia. However, if they were to have, for example, a renal disorder, for example, um, they could have hyperphosphatemia due to a lack of secretion of uh, phosphate. So uh, you, it's less likely um, in this context. So hypercalcemia is the correct answer here. So with myeloma, uh, a good mnemonic of remembering the uh, relationships between myeloma and its uh, complication is CRAB high. So cal hypercalcemia, renal impairment, anemia, bone disease, as we mentioned, and this hyperviscosity syndrome where it can lead to uh, thromboembolism, for example, you can get amyloidosis. And because you have a problem with your immune system, you can get recurrent infections. And myeloma is really a proliferation disorder of your B cells. So you would see on, see on that blood smear on the right-hand side, you can see um, Rouleau formation, you can see plasma cells as well right there. And then you can, um, so that, that's one of the key things actually, Rouleau formation, so having lots of blood cells clumping together as well. So that's something to, to make note of when you look at a blood film and you're wondering what this is. Um, so the key things we're looking at when you're diagnosing myeloma is you're looking for evidence of organ damage. And that distinguishes myeloma between other B-cell disorders that may not, not lead to organ damage. Um, you're looking for whether or not there is a paraprotein, uh, so a single monoclonal antibody, which comes up as an M-band um, on the protein electrophoresis, which can either be serum or urine. And also you would expect on the bone marrow biopsy to see um, an increase of monoclonal plasma cells as well. So you're doing your FBC, your ESR as well, your urine dipstick, looking for any evidence of any renal disorders. Um, urate can also be raised in myeloma. You're looking for evidence of bone disease, urine electrophoresis, and also we are looking for the, uh, finally, as a definitive investigation, if you're not sure what the diagnosis is, to do a bone marrow biopsy as well. And in terms of management, um, you can either treat conservatively if there's no end organ damage. You could treat with a stem cell transplant in young and fit patients. But as we've seen, we have lots of patients who have myeloma. You, they are slightly more elderly potentially, and they wouldn't be necessarily uh, able to undergo a stem cell transplant, for example. So you would treat with chemotherapy and steroids. But uh, as a junior doctor, you should be aware that if someone does come in with myeloma, um, and they, they may need to have adequate analgesia. They may need to, to ensure that they have good hydration. And uh, in the outpatient setting, you would make sure that they have bisphosphonates to check, their, check for any evidence of any anemia quite regularly and make sure that they are seen by community services such as the physiotherapy uh, as and when uh, that is required going forward as it's a chronic disease that can get better and get worse depending on uh, the treatments or depending on each individual with differing prognoses. Um, just to, in the context of myeloma, you can also get amyloidosis, which we mentioned briefly earlier. So you can get idiopathic primary amyloidosis or secondary caused by underlying disorders. The context of myeloma we were talking about earlier, it's a secondary um, disorder. And, and really, you're, you, what you have is this deposition of fibrins in the organs, the blood vessels. So you can get quite a lot of things going on. So you can get um, renal amyloid, so you can get renal failure. You can get uh, hematosplenomegaly, neuropathies, joint pain. You can get cardiac amyloid as well. Macroglossia is one thing that does come up in exams quite often, but this is very, very rare. It's a like very big tongue and amyloidosis. And really, you need a tissue biopsy. And you stain it with Congo red, which is, again, another buzzword to, to make sure that you keep in mind. And it uh, looks like apple green biofringes. 
uh, biofringence, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and one other uh, niche fact about amyloidosis is that uh, you often take the biopsy from the rectum. And uh, if we were to contrast, contrast that with another niche biopsy, uh, just in case it does come up in any of your exams, is that if someone has um, CJD, so Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, you would take the biopsy from the tonsils uh, and in amyloidosis, you would take it from the rectum. So that's another uh, distinction to be aware of. So this is what I was talking about earlier, the Congo red stain, and you can see apple green birefringence as well. So that is what you would expect to see in someone who has amyloidosis. This is question 13, so pause the screen and have a read. So this is a... 13-year-old male who comes in with recurrent infections, as it seems. There is coarse gravitations at the left base with some consolidation, extremely raised white cells. So probably you're thinking, is this a pneumonia? Yeah, probably. But what's the actual diagnosis that's causing this? Really, the, the key is the raised white cell, so extremely, extremely high. And there's a right age range, so about 80 years old. So the most likely diagnosis is a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, and that is because of the high white cells, age of about 80, and uh, so that it all does fit in. A TB is less likely, although it is possible, but we don't have any risk factors that we can see in front of us. Uh, there's not, no other piece of information that tells us this is sepsis. Again, could be HIV, but less likely given the very raised white cells, you'd expect it to be much lower, the white cells in HIV. And again, it is probably pneumonia in the background, but the underlying diagnosis is likely to be a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So chronic lymphocytic leukemia is secondary to proliferation of um, malignant B cells. And they, again, we were talking about how they are related to um, men, often in the age of 70 or 70, 80, usually they're actually asymptomatic. Um, and the you can see smudge cells, as you can see on the right-hand side, on the blood film. Um, and one other factor to take into consideration here is that they can uh, transform into a high-grade lymphoma, and this is called Richter syndrome. So that's just something to take note of as well in patients with CLL. You might want to consider watching and waiting in these patients. Um, so again, you may see exam questions that say, you know, you have someone with very raised white cells, what's the next best investigation if they're asymptomatic? And the answer is conservative, do nothing. Um, if they have very severe symptoms and they have anemia, thrombocytopenia, and uh, they are uh, they have uh, splenomegaly, for example, or lymphadenopathy that's getting worse, you may want to treat with chemotherapy as well. But you wouldn't have to make that decision as a medical student, certainly will be treated in a specialist center um, with a hematology consultant. And finally, to uh, complete our uh, tutorial today, just a nice mnemonic to keep you going. If you want to remember the causes of massive splenomegaly, Remember the four M's, so CML, myelofibrosis, malaria, and visceral leishmaniasis. It's another thing to remember if you're thinking about splenomegaly. So we've reviewed a lot today. Uh, thank you for uh, staying and uh, keeping your attention on hematology today. If you want to look at notes related to what we've reviewed today, you can look at this link, so bit.ly slash questbook. I uh, will allow you to access all the notes that were used to make this lecture, uh, and uh, hopefully that's useful for you. If you want access to uh, lots and lots of single best answer questions, flashcards, and our whole book of clinical notes, uh, you can sign up at questmed.com. So I hope that's useful for you. Um, and feel free to follow us on Instagram at QuestMed, where we have daily single best answer questions. And you can find out more about what we're doing in terms of developing more videos. And also you can follow us on Facebook. So please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And thank you very much for joining us.